Well, good morning, y'all. Um, my name's Sean Way, if y'all don't know me. Um, my wife's name is Amanda, and we have a two-year-old son named Jeremiah. Been a part of Grace since this church plant, and about two years prior to that over at Grace Waco, though our membership's probably only about six months old or something. We were slacking on that, but... Um, I'm an electrician and uh, jumped into that late in life. I um, used to teach Bible classes years ago. It's been a while, so I appreciate this opportunity um, to be able to teach now. Um, Slade's been taking us through um, a biblical hermeneutics class on how to study the Bible. And um, this week we're going to look at how study and the work of the Holy Spirit come together. Um, and we've learned through this class that hermeneutics is essential in this pursuit. Biblical, biblical hermeneutics has been defined for us as the science and art of interpreting the scriptures. And Slade has taken us through Rory Zook's book on uh, where we covered the need to bridge the cultural, grammatical, and literary gaps. Meaning, hermeneutics teaches us good principles and practices to interpret the passage in its original context, language, historical setting, genre, structure, and how seeing the text through this light will only then lead us to God's intended meaning and bring forth the obedience and worship he desires. This particular lesson seeks to bring hermeneutics into its biblical context and show that God not only desires us to apply good principles in our endeavor to uncover the true meaning, but also to lean into the divine help of the Holy Spirit. My purpose is to expound the scriptures and show biblical examples of how God has ordained the ministry of the Spirit in direct harmony with the study of the text to bring forth a proper interpretation and application. You'll need your Bibles open to follow me and answer questions along the way. This would be easier without being virtual, but um, I still always appreciate um, the interaction and kind of forcing you to look at the text for yourself. Um, so I know it may be hard, but feel free to um, unmute yourself, answer any questions. Um, and if, it's, if it doesn't come off real clear because I didn't do the best job, I'll, I'll throw it in there. Those questions are also on that handout, and if you uh, desire and you don't feel like writing down all the, the nuances throughout, I do have notes here that I would be happy to send anyone. If you wanted to just send me an email, it's seantway at gmail. So I'm going to open us up to, in prayer, and we'll jump into the scripture. Father, we do just thank you for the gathering of your body as you have called and ordained your church that we are bound together in love and stronger together. And so, Father, I just ask even now for grace uh, to proclaim the truth that you would awaken love and affection for your Son, that you would awaken a hunger for the Scripture, and that you, the knowledge of God would come forth in a clear light to spur uh, your people on into pursuing understanding, pursuing a connectedness to the truth and to the realities of eternity. Father, we thank you for your encouragement over us, um, your desire to, uh, to bring us closer, and uh, we just rest on that. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. All right, so if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, after Thessalonians, before Titus. So, a little bit of context. I'm only going to look at one verse, but I want to give the context and read the context just to help. We're going to mainly look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 7. But Paul wrote two epistles to Th Timothy, focusing on how he ought to regulate his life as a pastor and how the church of Christ ought to function. And then the exhortation that we're going to look at here comes in contrast to those who have de departed from the faith in chapter 1. And then out of a burden for the church to not yield to deception, Paul instructs Timothy to live differently. So I'm going to read the passage again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Paul says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 
No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. And this is the one we're going to focus on. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So this is the first question. It's pretty simple. And just, again, to get you to look at the text for yourself. Paul uses three analogies to depict the call and lifestyle of a pastor. He then gives Timothy a particular command with a promise. What is the command and what is the promise that accompanies it? So what is the command and what is the promise that accompanies it? And feel free to unmute yourself and answer. Good, exactly. And so the, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, so um, she said that the command was to think over um, what he says with the promise that you, if you do this, and in our context, studying the scriptures, um, you will be given understanding. So again, Paul says, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And so the ESV translates this as think over, this Greek word here, and NASB uses consider. Both terms work well as long as we understand the idea Paul was pushing here was to actively comprehend. And so this is the practical, logical role the Lord uses to bring us into understanding. In this sense, applying consideration to the scriptures is the call to apply biblical hermeneutic hermeneutic practices to determine the text's intended meaning. We can see here a method or a, a process described by Paul as a way to gain understanding, or in our context, how to get the intended meaning. Remember, that's, that's our goal when we talk about uh, using hermeneutics, the intended meaning. We are intentionally, we are to intentionally pursue the truth and apply ourselves towards comprehension while leaning into the Lord to open our eyes and give us understanding. There is both a practical role and a supernatural role. It's not one or the other. We, uh, it's not one or the other. We need both of them. We need the practical and the supernatural. We study and pray and pray while studying. Matthew Henry says concerning this verse, Consideration is the way to understand, remember, and practice what we hear or read. Consideration is the way to understand, remember, practice what we hear and read. And then Paul confirms this idea later in the chapter in verse 15. If you look down in the text of verse 15, he says to Timothy again, Do your best or be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. This text is perhaps the one most commonly used to highlight the Bible's endorsement of biblical hermeneutics. Although as Paul is addressing Timothy's validation as a minister, it's fair to say there is a responsibility upon all professing believers to apply diligence towards discovering the true meaning of a passage to properly interpret and explain. So just uh, the application of this and reviewing, we have seen in this passage there is a method that God has endorsed, simply applying reason logic and discernment to understand, understand the scriptures is not enough. Ultimately, God is the one who gives understanding and ultimately sets the rules to which he gives it. We ought to be encouraged all the more to pursue biblical hermeneutics knowing that God points us to consideration and that in the context of consideration, God is pleased to unveil the truth. Good biblical hermeneutics comes down to seeking the scriptures in a spirit of dependence, relying upon God to give revelation. The Holy Spirit pushes us towards study, and in study, the Spirit gives understanding. And I say that again. The Holy Spirit pushes us towards study. So he's the one right now pushing us to, to that intended meaning, beckoning us into uh, the discovery of hermeneutics and 
proper exegesis. So the Holy Spirit pushes us towards study, and in study, the Spirit gives understanding. We attentively study the Scriptures dependent on the Spirit to work, all along recognizing that the Spirit urges us to consider these things. The same God that called Timothy calls the indigenous believer and the scholar in the West to think upon what he has said with a promise to give understanding. So we're going to jump all the way over to Mark, Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 4. And I apologize if it seems like I'm going quickly because, it, because I am. I uh, have a lot to probably bit off more than I, I can chew and trying to cover a lot. But Mark chapter 4. So my point here is not to give a thorough expository teaching on this passage, but to highlight some of the critical and fundamental elements Jesus desired for us to hear. It's hard to estimate how important this text is when compared to the rest of Scripture, but I will say it is extremely important. One of the most important passages in the Bible, especially in light of eternity and considering how Jesus presents the teaching, saying over and over, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So, read through Mark. I'm not going to focus on the parable itself, but some of the, the context and the uh, outlaying verses that surround it. Assuming that you're somewhat familiar with it, again, I encourage you to read through these things on your own if you haven't already. So Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, again, he, speaking of Jesus, began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and set on it, uh, set in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, listen, a sower went out to sow, and then he begins to tell the parable of the sower, and he finishes it in verse 9 saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then verse 10, and when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables, and he said to them, to you have been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? The sower sows the word, and then he begins the explanation and then he sums it up and or finishes it in verse 20 with the, the good soil and says, But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said to them in verse 21, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So I chose Mark's gospel because I think it brings the, the parable of the sower into its context. And you get to see it in its truest, truest light. And so I'm going to jump back to verses 11 and 12 and I'll start the questions there. So Jesus lays out some key principles as to how God reveals truth to the human heart. In consideration of verses 11 and 12, why does Jesus tell parables throughout his ministry? So that's my first question for you. So looking at specifically at verses 11 and 12, Jesus kind of tells why he tells parables. So why does Jesus tell parables throughout his ministry? word. And, um, 
and I know that what I was taught about verse, verse 12 is just playing wrong. So I hope you can square that up for me. Uh, I, I could maybe see that in some sense. I think, I think in, an, in one light, the, the scripture comes for two people for judgment on that day so that they don't have an excuse. Um, I think of Matthew 24 and saying that the gospel has to go to the ends of the earth. And it, it's kind of a sense of, you know, that, that the scripture has gone out and they are held accountable. But uh, I think from scripture, we understand that judgment does correlate with someone's personal knowledge. So, Anyone else want to want to comment again? The question: Why does Jesus tell parables throughout his ministry, focusing on God, how God reveals truth, how God has decided in His wisdom to reveal truth? Yeah. Yeah, no, excellent point. Jim gave a great illustration of, of picturing parables as a fence surrounding the garden and using the illustration that Jesus picked up on with the soils, and he referred it back to the Garden of Eden and, and who gets in. And, and picturing the parables as a, as a fence to keep certain people out, but while making it almost easier for others. And so I think that's a, that's a great way to look at it. And so Jesus, in this context, he says, basically, those outside, which would require some definition, but so that they would not perceive, that they would not understand and not be forgiven. And it sounds very different coming from his mouth in that way. But in one sense, parables are to make truth easy um, to the humble, as Jim was relying on, in that fence to keep out the, the proud and the strong and the wise and the self-reliant. Um, but primarily Jesus is saying here that it was to make truth hard to understand. And what is the reason? Simply put, it's so that mankind wouldn't catch it at first glance. And, and in my own language, it's the best way. It's, it kind of acts as that fence in that, in that way so that only certain persons would understand. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to drop down to verses 21 and 22. So he gives the explanation of the parable. He kind of tells why he tells parables. He wants to make truth hard in one, in one sense. He wants to veil truth. And then he gives the explanation. And then he follows it up with this in, in verse 21 and 22. After explaining the parable of the sower, Jesus goes on to question them saying, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand. And then gives an explanation saying, for nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. The implication here is that there are indeed meanings and secret truths. There are things that are hidden. So this is the question. So what reason could we assign as to why God hides a matter and makes a thing secret? And Jesus kind of tells us here, but I'm reaching for your own language. So my question again, what, what reason could we assign as to why then does he hide certain things and keep certain true secret? Going back to verse 11, he's talking to the disciples and he's telling them, I'm going to give you the secrets of the kingdom. And then he kind of tells them how a lot of people are not going to perceive it. I'm going to use this tool so everyone just won't get it. And then he kind of tells them, okay, but then I don't want to hide you. I want you to go out and be a light to the world. So it's kind of, he's, he's, he's revealing his game plan on how the gospel will be spread. And then ultimately we know that once he's crucified, the disciples who become apostles now have the keys to the kingdom. 
then they go forth and now they have the authority and then you know then the church and all those things so i i think it's it's contextually it's, it's kind of the manif- the, the manifest of how jesus is going to the plan of god okay I like that. I like that perspective on it, and I think he he uses some of these similar uh, illustrations in different contexts. And I, and I, and the one that you're you know referring to with being a light um, set on uh, a city set on a hill, a light to the world. Um, uh, I, I think a, v- a very similar. I'm focusing on a little different with the the context in hand as far as um, you know having ears to hear and. Um, and the the method of truth, but I, I definitely connect with some of those ideas there. Matthew 11, Sean. Uh-huh. Uh, I have hidden these things, he says to the wise, to a hidden these things, but revealed them to children. Yeah. So he's highlighting his grace given to the simple and the unproud. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So Jim, Jim referred to Matthew 11 and how Jesus finishes that chapter up, uh, praising God for, for thanking the Father for his methodology. And that's a little bit what Robert was alluding to, God's uh, sovereign election and wisdom to reveal truth to mere children and babes and yet hide it from others and scholars and the wise and the rich. Um, and so right here, you know, Jesus making these obvious statements, you're not going to light a lamp and then put it under the bed um, or hide it. And he follows it with the four. And a four is an important one to understand that, you know, we don't use the word for a lot in, in our modern language. We use the word because, but, but it's very helpful in Scripture to understand, hey, when you see that word for a lot, beginning those sentences, it's connecting you to what's before before that, with as the word because does. And... Um, so he says nothing is hidden except to be made manifest. So essentially, he's saying, it's, it's like a paradox, he hides a matter so that it would be made manifest. He brings forth a secret so that it would come to light. With regard to the passage context concerning truth and interpretation, Jesus tells us the reason God conceals the meaning is so that we would seek it out. And not only seek it out, but find it. And so when we're presented with hard truths and parables, it's almost an invitation. It's, it's God going, I lit this lamp not, uh, not to be put under um, a basket or under a bed, but so that it would be discovered, so that it would be made manifest. And Jesus follows this in verse 24. Um, he follows the, revel- uh, the revelation with an application and a warning. And he says, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. In light of this exhortation, how do our efforts relate to what we actually get out of Bible study? So the, the follow-up question with this is he says, pay attention. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So considering the, the context of the study, how do our efforts relate to what we actually get out of studying the Bible? It seems to me that um, how much effort you use is how much you're going to get out of it, right? And the measure you use will be measured against you. So how much you put in is how much you get out. And that seems to be the idea. Exactly, yeah. Um, it, in, and obviously it's not in the, the strictest sense, but you can have as much or little as you want. If you're content to live without understanding and to content to muse over the scriptures, you're not going to get, you're not going to get anything out of it. Um, but God is so pleased to reveal his truth that when we apply ourselves and, uh, take heed to these things, more will be given to you. <clears throat> and then Jesus kind of sums up this whole parable. I think this is one of the best uh, contextual clues when he says, pay attention to what you hear. It's almost a summary of the whole thing. And, and one of those key interpretive, uh, interpretive practices with 
parables is sometimes the application there at the end, you may not have a clue what's going on, but that application comes out so clear or a summary that it, it unfolds to you the rest. And so if you hang on to one thing from this whole text, it's pay attention to what you hear. That's Jesus calling you right there. Pay attention to what you hear. And then verse 25 Jesus says, for the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. It's almost like you want to ask, has what? You know, it's like he's leaving something out there. Or what will be given? Now that we understand the context a little better, we have an idea of what Jesus was referring to. I believe the idea he's trying to get across is to say, the one who has attentiveness, or you could insert hunger, uh, the one who has attentiveness, more understanding will be given. I believe at the core, what he's trying to get across to us is if you have attentiveness, more understanding will be given to you. And then on the back end, it, it falls the same way. If you're careless or if you're dull, if you're careless with regard to the word, even what understanding you have will be taken away from you. And this is a, a wonderful and yet terrifying promise. The proclamation of truth is never neutral in our lives. We either press in and gain insight or we're, we harden our hearts and grow dangerously dull. We cannot be casual in our response to the truth. Jesus is in no way undermining our dependence for God or elevating the human effectiveness in study, but instead is showing us how genuine faith is manifest in the pursuit of understanding. I say that again, Genu how genuine faith is manifest in the pursuit of understanding. Bible study is baptized in the reality that it cannot grow a cubit outside of God unfolding revelation, which means we practice her hermeneutics with a hungry heart and a spirit of dependence, knowing it is God who is drawing us and God who is going to send forth his light. We even see this exemplified in the passage by the apostles approaching Jesus for understanding. Jump all the way back to verse 13 um, in the passage. Jesus prefaces the interpretation of the parable by, by saying, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? By making this statement, Jesus assigns great importance to this parable and reveals to us that the key lies within the explanation. Jesus implies that if we do not understand the parable of the sower, that we will not be able to understand all other parables. Given what we just learned, how do we understand this? How does understanding this parable help us to understand all other parables or hidden truths? So again, I'm going to say it again. Uh, given what we've learned, how does understanding this parable, the parable of the sower, help us to understand all other parables or hidden truths? Yeah, no, I, I like that. I like that. It's very much, I think you could say, a game plan or setting the rules for the game. Um, something along those lines. It's good. I appreciate that. Um, there's so much to say in regards to this parable that I don't want to neglect or undermine the context of a person's response to the gospel and the greater context of the work of God in conversion. But I do believe in its most fundamental context, Jesus is beckoning for a response, and that response is essential in the process of understanding the truth. This process or rule is so crucial that our Lord highlights it as a means to understand all mysterious teaching. I believe the parable of the sower teaches us the importance of paying attention. Again, back to his words, pay attention to what you hear. 
especially with regard to those truths of Scripture, we do not seem to apprehend at first, demanding that we undercover, uncover every stone until light is given. Quoting Matthew Henry again, he says, This parable is to teach you to be attentive to the word and affected with it that you may understand it. If you receive not this, you will not know how to use the key by which you must be let into all the rest. If we understand not the rules we are to observe in order to our profiting by the word, how shall we profit by any other rule? So to sum it up, God gives truth that is hard to understand, and we therefore need to take more care in our motives and efforts to understand, not draw back. We also see there's a heart posture that is more readily adapted to drink in heart truth, that humble heart um, that Jim's referring to and Robert. We are to seek the scriptures in faith and humility and lovingly regard them with fear and trembling. I perceive the gospel reaching out to me in these types of texts more so than my need to stir myself up and find a way in myself. Christ bringing attention to our need for responsiveness does not mean we go hammer it out on our own to present something acceptable. Applied hermeneutics is the overflow of the hungry heart. And this is kind of the main point here for us. Applied hermeneutics is the overflow of the hungry heart, the attentive heart. In the context of searching, we will find and more will be given to us. Scripture speaks emphatically concerning God's judgment on the dull and unresponsive. We see Jesus rebuking his disciples throughout Mark's gospel for a lack of understanding. So let us embrace the fear of the Lord and his grace to shake off dullness as we are confronted with the blessing and curse that result from our attentiveness or lack thereof. All right, so the last little bit, we're going to take a look at an example from the book of Daniel and looking at Daniel's life. He's a a profound example of that. So if you want to turn your Bibles to the book of Daniel, after Ezekiel, before Hosea, we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 2 first and then Daniel 9. So Daniel chapter 2. So a little context for Daniel. Um, This part of Israel's history, redemptive history, is very important. Probably one-third of the the Old Testament um, revolves around this time frame, either before or after. The specific dates aren't necessarily important as long as you understand the context to which a lot of these books are written, and Daniel's one of them. And so Daniel's story begins around 605 B.C., God had raised up a a world empire, Babylon, to accomplish his purpose and and begin something that would ultimately culminate at the end of this age. And um, he brings Babylon into Israel to... Uh, to scatter them. And over a 20-year period, there's, there's three times that Babylon comes up and takes captive uh, people and ultimately destroys the temple that is in Jerusalem. And so Daniel's story begins here. He's part of that first group that goes, and he's, he's young, and probably between the ages of 12 and 14 at the time of the captivity. So think of this kind of teenager, young, maybe a little bit older um, teenager. And It's in Daniel's three years of training that he has this first recorded encounter with God that's laid out for us in chapter 2. And then Daniel was in his 60s before he had his first significant vision recorded in chapter 7. And then in his 80s when he had his final vision from chapters 10 to 12. So we get a really good glimpse at uh, this man's life. So why... Did God give these detailed visions to Daniel? It's here we discover the revelation of God that touched Daniel in a unique way and caused him to live a life pursuing understanding of the scriptures and the unknown. So I'm going to read from Daniel. I'm not going to read the whole thing again, some selected passages. I do encourage you to to go back and read the whole chapter. if you haven't already. So Daniel chapter two, starting in verse one, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar is the the ruler over Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. 
the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans, Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. So the king has this dream and he's very frustrated about it and, uh, issues the most ridiculous edict to, to kill everyone if they can't tell him not only the interpretation, but the dream itself. So obviously they're going, no one can do this. And it just stirs up his anger even more as, as you continue to read. And, uh, and then he sends out the edict, hey, go, go kill all these guys. Well, Daniel's part of this group that was standing before the king, being trained, and he has the wisdom to try to buy some time, and he actually gets to talk to Nebuchadnezzar in verse 16 and, and buy some time, and then pick, pick back up in verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. These, this is the same um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that we, we see in the next chapter, thrown into the fire. So he's with his buddies, verse 18, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. <clears throat> Okay, so Daniel has this life-changing encounter and worships God for the answered prayer. Daniel reveals a specific facet, or sorry, God reveals a specific facet of his nature. And Daniel declares, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in darkness and light dwells with him. So my question for you is, what are the implications of this statement? Or I'm going to ask it another way as well. What made this facet of God so wonderful and life-changing? So really searching for the same answer, but if, if one, one question helps more than the other, but what are the implications of this revelation that Daniel got? Or what made this facet of God so wonderful and life-changing? He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in darkness and light dwells with him. What is Daniel proclaiming right here? What's, what are the implications for him? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's essentially it. Yeah. It's, it's nothing necessarily too profound, but, but looking at it and seeing how Daniel was affected by this revelation and how it shapes 
the rest of his life. And so essentially God is the source of revelation and the revealer of mysteries. And that implication follows as there's nothing too mysterious and we have direct means to understanding. We can go to God as the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And when we consider Daniel and we go, well, what, in what manner was Daniel seeking God? It, he was seeking God as if his life depended on it. You know, he was, he was going at this thing uh, because a, a, a death warrant was, was hanging over him and his friends and over the, uh, the rest of um, his, his sort of co-workers. But um, and I, I want to point that out just to go, God was the one behind the scenes right here. God's the one that gave the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. God's the one that put Daniel in this position all because he wants to reveal this facet of his nature to Daniel. He wants Daniel to see this aspect that he is the one that's, that's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's the one who gives revelation to the hungry. And so Daniel learned that God not only gives an invitation to revelation, but that he enjoys revealing the secrets of his heart. We must understand this truth about God. He loves to give understanding to those who seek him. He is the one behind the scenes stirring up hunger in our hearts and drawing us so that he may reveal himself to us in a deeper way. And when we grab a hold of this, when we see God, it really is the one behind reaching out to us. And even as we're reading the text and we feel stumped and, and to realize in those moments, even God is reaching out to us. This is the fuel behind pursuing understanding, pursuing hermeneutics, and it's radically life-changing if you can see this. And it, it radically changed and shaped the way of Daniel. I'm going to go ahead and start summing it up, but we were going to look at Daniel chapter 9 as well, and I'm going to leave you with that to, to go and, and search that out on your own. But essentially, God had ordained Israel, 70 years to be taken from their land, and it's, it's for specific reasons. And Daniel is, gets to live through this whole exile, and he's in the land of Babylon when that 70 years is complete. And God had promised to bring down the Babylonian empire and then bring Israel back to their land and then rebuild the temple. And Daniel's watching this unfold, and he's reading the Bible. He has these scrolls before him, and he's understanding from the book of Jeremiah, and, it, and he's quoting Moses in chapter 9 as well, or, or references him. And he's reading Deuteronomy, he's reading Jeremiah, he's connecting to the Scripture, but he's lacking the understanding and the reality of it. And so he, in chapter 9, God records the prayer, and he tells Daniel, hey, write this thing down. And Daniel's fasting and praying for understanding and reaching for revelation. And this, this that happened to him in his teenage years, this revelation of God so affected his life that it sustained him in that place of hunger, of, of longing for God to bring his, his word to fulfillment, longing for understanding, knowing that God is on the other side of this thing, ready to give an answer. And so Daniel lived this life of seeking God and Daniel gets a divine answer. And the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and he gives him the answer. And not only that, he tells, he tells Daniel, you are greatly loved, or some translations say you are beloved. And God, God doesn't just write it just to say, hey, Daniel, I really like you, I love you. But God was putting an exclamation upon his life and upon this aspect of which I'm presenting to you. The, the hunger and the pursuit in faith, in humility is so pleasing that God's going, I'm gonna put an exclamation on this kind of similar to how Jesus does in the gospel, like, oh, there's no, there's no faith like this in all of Israel or Mary of Bethany. Jesus goes, I'm gonna, wherever the gospel goes, I'm gonna tell this story in a similar way, puts an exclamation on her life. Well, God put an exclamation on Daniel's life for this reality of him pursuing understanding, him giving heed and paying attention. <clears throat> so sum it up real quickly. In order for us to properly interpret the scripture and to possess the skill to discern the truth, we ought to pursue good hermeneutical practices out of a heart that has a sacred regard for the scripture, completely dependent upon the spirit to open our eyes, understanding our inability to get there on our own 
and encouraged, knowing God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The Lord wants to stir us to seek out the unknown. God is the one who has availed the truth for the purpose that we would seek it out in him. We set out to discover what God intended for us to know, opposed to projecting our own meaning into the text to accomplish our own ends. This is the context to which we pursue understanding and to which God blesses and gives understanding. We honor and glorify God by embracing this pursuit. It moves his heart when we respond by taking time and giving attention to the scripture out of a genuine faith. And to close with the Albert Barnes quote, he says, All might find truth if they would seek it. None ever will find it if they do not apply for it to the great source of light, the God of truth, and seek it patiently in the way in which he has chosen to communicate it to mankind. How highly should we prize the Bible and how patiently and prayerfully should we search the scriptures that we may not err and die forever. I'm going to close this in prayer. Father, we we thank you for your word. We thank you for that open invitation every time we open the scriptures. And Father, I just ask for that spirit of wisdom and revelation that you would open the eyes of our heart, open the eyes of our understanding that we could see and understand the God who cares so much and the God who has spoken. Father, that we would be gripped on the inside to be changed and to live differently, to live a life of pursuing understanding, to have that conviction, to take heed and pay attention and to... uh, to have a heart that reaches. And so, Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the power and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. I just pray that you would uh, touch these and um, bless them today and bless the hearing of the word as Michael preaches. We thank you, Father. Amen.